Hi, thank you all for showing up tonight. Uh, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about endemic trypanomatosis. Now, uh, it's not very common in the United States, but it's important for us as infectious disease specialists to be able to recognize uh, these diseases and able to treat it, especially when we have uh, patients coming from abroad, immigrants who might uh, present with, uh, with, with these symptoms. So, uh, endemic trypanomatosis consists of three basic uh, entities. The first one is EOS, which is caused by chronic infection of Trypanema pallidum subspecies pertinu. The second one is endemic uh, syphilis, which is caused by Trypanema pallidum subspecies endemicum, and it's also known as Bijel. The third one is Pinta. It's caused by a different species, basically the Trypanema keratium. As I said earlier, these diseases are not very common in the states. They're mostly in developing nations, countries, uh, and we see them in developed countries such as the United States as a result of immigration, people coming from these countries. They're basically very similar to Trypanema pallidum, subspecies pallidum, which causes the venereal syphilis, the syphilis basically, morphologically and serologically. And most of the tools that we have these days are based on the management of syphilis. This is where we adopted them from. Currently, uh, the estimate of these three is 2.5 million people that are affected. Now, there's about uh, 460,000 people or infectious cases, but 2.5 million are basically infected. As you can see, you can't tell the difference between the three of them. They all look alike. Uh, just a few words about the Japanese. I'm, I'm sorry because the slides are a little off. Uh, the Japanese are basically long and thin spirals and they're known for their corkscrew motility. They're too tiny to be seen by Gram stain. Uh, that's why we can see them in dark field microscopy and fluorescent antibody techniques. Mo what, we, what we know about them is they're, they're all susceptible to penicillin and tetracycline based on clinical responses that we've had and serological responses when we trend the RPR for example and based on a few uh, studies that were done in experimental animals. Now, uh, we do not have MICs or minimal inhibitory uh, concentration or bactericidal concentration on these uh, species basically because we cannot propagate them, uh, we cannot culture them basically. Now, a few words about uh, how, where we can find them. Basically, yaws is it's this called basically it's turquoise but it doesn't really show so we can find it worldwide but basically between minus 30 and plus 30 in the tropics the bee gel we can find it mostly in the arid areas of Africa and the Arabic pen Peninsula Pinta is more uh, restrained to uh, Latin America including Cuba and the Caribbeans now these most of the diseases or all of them are transmitted through direct contact non sexual contact a um, few of them, for example, the bee gel is transmitted through fomites. And unlike the syphilis, these, we don't have any evidence that these diseases are transmitted via blood or blood products or congenitally, transplacentally. Now, f these diseases, they share certain clinical manifestations. First of all, uh, there's an initial lesion that happens at the site of inoculation, whether there's an insect bite or normally there's a cut or there's a, you know, a break of the skin that's going to facilitate the invasion of treponemes. The incubation period for all of them, the three of them, is 9 to 50 days with a mean of 21 days. What's common, again, for these three is that early on, sometimes even before we have the primary lesions, the treponemes will spread hematogenously. And then that's why we're going to have a secondary manifestation of the disease and sometimes the late manifestation of the disease. The three of them are characterized by an you know, early phase where we have epithelial lesions and they're different between the three of them. It could be an erythematous plaque or macules, sometimes papules or uh, wart-like lesions. With these primary lesions we're going to have some regional lymphadenopathy, not in, not in all the cases but in most of them. And similar to the syphilis, the yaws and bijel, for example, the primary lesions or sometimes the secondary are going to heal without treatment, uh, and, and sometimes we're going to have the late manifestation later on. Um, in a minority of the patients, as I said earlier, there's late infection, not in all of them. 
and the late infections are pretty dramatic. They have, we have very destructive lesions, sometimes ulcerative, sometimes hyperkeratotic, as you can see here. Uh, we're going to have sometimes bone and joint deformities and involvement. And what's interesting, or we should keep in mind, is that with these three diseases, we don't have cardiovascular disease or involvement or neuro neurologic sequelae as in we have in syphilis. And there's no transmission to children you know, there's no transplacental uh, transmission, basically. Now, we're going to go, you know, uh, over each one separately. So, Yaws, which is the chronic infection with Treponema pallidum, subspecies pertinu, it is the most common of them three. It is uh, most common in children between 2 to 15 years, and it's trans uh, transmitted uh, through direct contact. And the risk factors are crowding and relative lack of hygiene, and probably that's why we find it in this age group, you know, because of the lack of hygiene, kids don't wash their hands all the time, they share utensils and stuff like that. Uh, the primary lesion, as you can see here, normally it's a papule, sometimes it could be a wart-like lesion. Typically it's pruritic, and which is going to facilitate the auto-inoculation, it's going to facilitate the spread of this, of these lesions. Uh, we're going to have sometimes regional lymphadenopathy with it. With it. Now over a few, few months, this lesion is going to increase in size, and, so, and it's going to heal spontaneously. But sometimes even before it heals, we're going to have secondary lesions a little distant, as we said, sometimes because of auto-inoculation, auto sometimes because of the spread. Uh, we're going to have the secondary lesions uh, distant to it. Now, the secondary lesions as well can involve the skin, the bone, and um, the joints. <laughs> I'm sorry, for, it's not really... Uh, yeah, but basically the secondary lesions will heal on their own sometimes. <laughs> now, in about 10% of the cases, we're going to have late infections, which could be sometimes hyperkeratotic lesions and sometimes bony lesions. As you can see here, we have the gummas, as you can see. Um, we might have something called gangosa, which is real disfiguring. We have a destruction of the bone of the face as well as the cartilage and the soft tissue. As, are you going to end up with lesions such as this one or this one? Sometimes because of the chronic periostitis, we're going to have um, bowing of the anterior tibia, which is going to what we call saber shin. It looks like a saber, the curved sword. All these, just keep in mind, could be aborted with penicillin if somebody was exposed. Uh, now the second entity is endemic syphilis. It's also known as Bijil, if I'm saying it right. Uh, this entity is caused by Trepanema pallidum subspecies endemicum. It is not as common as yaws. As we said earlier, it's basically restrained to Africa, the northern part and the arid dry parts of Africa, and the Arabic Peninsula as well. Um, it's a disease of childhood as well, 2 to 15 years of age. It is transmitted uh, through direct contact as well. But the difference between this entity and yaws is that this one is transmitted through fomites because the primary lesion is in the oral mucosa and kids share utensils to eat and to drink and this will facilitate the transmission of this disease. And as I said earlier, the primary lesions are basically in the oral mucosa. We're going to have uh, mucus patches, sometimes colitis or angular stomatitis. And these lesions are typically painless. And as I said earlier, same thing as yaws and syphilis, they're going to resolve on their own without therapy. But after that, we're going to have the secondary lesions. They are, you know, a little more spread than the primary lesions. They're muc mucosal as well. And sometimes we're going to have the bony and cartilage involvement as in yaws. Sometimes this, the rash basically sometimes could be misleading because it could, like same thing for syphilis. We can have a myriad of presentations. And this is going to be the same thing for this entity. You can see the mouth lesions, you can see the skin rashes, so it's pretty uh, various. Same thing for the other diseases, there's a lit period of latency, and, and, and in this, in the endemic syphilis, they're pretty common. And they present as gummas, as you can see, I don't know if it shows, and you can see the deformity of the bone, the saber shins, and the gangosa that we saw with yaws with the uh, involvement of the face, the bone, the cartilage, uh, and the soft tissue. Now the third one is Pinta. Pinta is a little different than the others. First of all, it's caused by another species of Treponema, tre Treponema karatium. It's rarer, it's very limited to uh, South America and Central America, Caribbeans, including Cuba. It happens in 
a little older age, between 15 and 30 years of age. And it happens as well through, you know, it's transmitted as well through direct contact. Now, the difference with the other disease is that this one does not go away on its own. Without treatment, the lesion is not going to go. It's going to keep on growing. So first of all, we start off with a lesion that could be primary, an epithelial plaque, a redness on areas of the body that are not clothed. So the hands, the feet, the legs, sometimes the face, as you can see here. Uh, and they typically start enlarging with time and they become more hyperkeratotic. As you can see, they're pretty hyperkeratotic and they're, they disseminate. They, they're not going to go uh, they're here to stay basically um, as we said earlier they're gonna disseminate they're gonna get bigger and they're gonna get more pigmented and sometimes they take the color slate blue as you can see in this picture uh, sometimes we're gonna end up with dyschromic which means a different color uh, lesions that contain treponemes basically and achromic hypopigmented or apigmented treponine free lesions now the depigmentation happens at different rates of the same lesion so you can see areas of pigmentation others that are not uh, same thing here some areas are depigmented others are not but what and another difference with the other diseases in that pinta does not include uh, late complications which is the difference between yaws and bijou now the diagnosis how do we diagnose it Normally, it's based on clinical findings. So we have the good, you know, the adequate settings, certain countries where certain, these diseases are endemic. We have the clinical finding, the typical primary lesion or secondary, the bone, the gangosa, the saber shins. Um, so sometimes this is enough. Now we can confirm it with serologic testing. I just want to say one thing that dark field microscopy makes it very easy and it's specific. Same thing as immunofluorescent antibodies. But unfortunately, in the countries where these diseases are endemic, we don't always have access to dark field microscopy or immunofluorescence. Um, now, regarding the serologic testing, it's the same for syphilis, as we said. Humorally, they have the same uh, antibodies, so they're indistinguishable uh, with treponema syphilis, uh, pallidum, subspecies syphilis. And the serologic testing is not all, only important for diagnosing uh, these cases, it's important for screening uh, communities sometimes to be able to take measures at, or action to try and eradicate it. Uh, same thing as in syphilis, there's the non treponemal and the treponemal test. I just wrote a little, uh, made a little table just to remind you that the non treponemal test, the, basically the RPR and the VDRL, they're based on the fact that uh, treponema pallidum and the cardiolipin cholesterol less than they have antigens in common that's why we have the cross reactivity and this is what these tests are based on the rpr and vdrl we can use them for screening and sometimes we can use them to monitor for a therapy to see if the the patient is adequately treated or not now the other part uh, the treponemal test the fda uh, fluorescent treponema antibody absorption, the TPHA, which stands for treponema pallidum hemagglutination, and the ELISAs are based on the fact that, uh, you know, it's pretty specific. We have uh, reactivities of antibodies to treponema pallidum antigens. So these tests, basically, we use them for confirmation, and sometimes we use them as screening. As, as we know, for treponema syphilis now, it's the reversed um, uh, chart. Instead of starting with RPR VDRLs these days, we're you know the trend is more to start with the treponemal test and then do the RPR now in most of these settings sometimes we don't have access for treponemal tests so they go by the RPR and VDRL if it's high enough and we have the correct clinical settings it's diagnostic and it will help the guide the management especially that the false positive serologic tests for RPR and VDRL normally are rarely higher than one over four so if you have one over two, one over one, huh? but if it's one over eight or one over 16, most likely or less likely, it's gonna be false positive. Uh, and it's always good to help us, uh, you know, keep in mind that this patient could be reinfected or could have a relapse disease. And just keep in mind that the treponemal tests are less likely to revert, to, to revert which is a difference between uh, RPR and VDRL, which normally they trend down after treatment, uh, successful treatment. Now regarding the treatment, normally the treatment for these diseases is penicillin. It is the preferred drug. Uh, and we prefer the benzathine penicillin, basically. 
because it provides a high trepan- treponemocytal uh, serum level for several weeks after we give it, and it's not expensive and it's highly efficient. Now the WHO recommends uh, the the following dose: 1.2 million u- times one, and which is one thing to keep in mind. It's very important to treat the household members and the close contacts. This could pre- prevent a lot of diseases. The cure rate is very high, and we think when we have a failure, is because because either the drug is expired, or it wasn't adequately given, or the patient was exposed to you know another source that's that was not treated, has not been treated. Certain studies showed that benzathine penicillin and oral penicillin as e- are equally effective, uh, but the thing, the problem is with adherence. We cannot trust these patients are going to take the oral penicillin for a certain times, so we'd rather give, and that's why the WHO so- still recommends the IM benzathine penicillin. Now we extrapolated, uh, if we extrapolate data from uh, treating syphilis, the venereal syphilis, tetracycline and doxycycline are likely to be as effective and studies have shown that they are. Uh, a few words about the public health management. In 19, and this disease uh, after 1950s it went down because there was a, a WHO had a campaign they screened whole communities, entire communities for these diseases and they divided them between high serologic prevalence where we have a prevalence more than 10% so in, in these communities, they treated everybody, whether they had, you know, clinical manifestations or not. The other category is the medium prevalence people, uh, communities where we had a prevalence of the disease between 5 and 10 percent. In these in communities, they treated only infected invid- individuals and their contacts. Now, in the low prevalence settings where the prevalence of the diseases were less than 5 percent, I'm talking serologically, of course, only individuals who had active lesions were treated and their contacts. During this campaign, more than 150 million ex- people were seen, and more than 150 million people in six, 46 countries were treated. Now, this has or have reduced um, the global prevalence of these diseases by 95 percent, which is huge. But uh, of course, as the disease you know trended down, the effort or the interest of or the surveillance or the money went down as well, and that's why. Over the last past two decades, the infection rate has started climbing up again, trending up again. Uh, and that's why these days we have 460,000 plus or minus cases that are, uh, that are infectious and 2.5 millions all over the world. Now, another point of to show you how important it is to prevent these diseases, in India there was a similar campaign where they, uh, you know, they did the control measures and they reduced the cases from 3,571 in 1996 to zero in 2004. And in 2006, India declared that they have eliminated, uh, you know, yaws, for example. So um, this is, I think this is the most important thing, is just to keep in mind that uh, preventing diseases is way more important than treating them. And sometimes these serological, um, you know, screening that was done, it's going to help prevent these diseases uh, and I think that's the most important part and thank you all for listening and showing up tonight